So when I open it, I, I always like looking at all of this beautiful propolis. propolis yeah. At some point, we should make a special video about the propolis, how to harvest it and how to use it, because this is wonderful, wonderful um, natural antibiotic. Uh, this time of year, late in October, is the right time to be harvesting your honey. It's still not too cold to be able to go into the hives. Today is very nice and sunny with temperatures in the 70s. On the other hand, you're past the peak of the summer activity when the hive was so busy with so many bees that uh, any intervention would have been disruptive for the bees and for the beekeeper. That uh, the summer is over whatever they've collected in terms of honey is already there inside the hive so we have a very good uh, estimate of how we can leave them for the winter and how much we can take look at this beautiful frame of honey another benefit of pulling honey so late is that the cells with honey are fully capped that means uh, the honey has been completely ripened by the bees. Like just a mark, this one is ready to go. And this one is beautiful. Uh, honey all the way down. Now, how do you tell how much you can uh, take and how much you leave bees for the winter? So when you do harvest, you start at the end of the hive opposite the open entrance. Right. By the open entrance, they've been preparing the nest for wintering. Yes. And whatever they don't need for wintering, they've been storing away from the entrance in this portion of the hive. So obviously these frames are away from the entrance, are, are yours. Uh, they're so far from their brood nest that even if you were to leave them in there, bees won't be able to make any use of them in the winter right. at all. And actually, you know, beginner beekeepers think, oh, I want to be generous with the bees and leave them all of the honey for the winter so they don't starve. But in reality, if we were to leave all of these frames there, it would be not the ideal situation for them because they would have to heat a much bigger area. And the reason why we're keeping a little lid on here is because we just worked so hard cleaning them all off and if you leave the lid off all the bees will jump in that box and start getting on the honey. <laughs> yeah. Especially late in the season when there are not many flowers around. Yeah. And there. Uh, oh I love you know this sir. Uh, nice warm day in the fall when you go and you open the hives and you cannot smell what Doug and I can smelling in addition to this beautiful honey there is all of the smell of propolis, propolis. and honey com coming from the colony and to me it's almost as pleasurable as assisting to the home birth of your child <laughs> so the completion of this uh, miracle of our He's really into new it. birth. <laughs> you know, another reason why you want to pull these frames that are completely full of honey is when the bees winter, it's better for them to only have honey on top and some empty cells under honey. This is where they will cluster and then move up, gradually consuming honey during the winter. So uh, the frames that are filled with honey all the way down is really yours to take. Right. If you have what's called cross combing in your hive, either you need to correct it very, very early, but you really are not there to know when it's starting. Um, if you have it uh, connected like that, I always recommend leaving it until honey harvest time when there is no brood and very few bees. Because trying to separate this honey in the middle of the summer really riles up the bees and uh, mm, you won't be able to do it uh, without getting a few stings here and there. The reason I'm peeling them together is that uh, there is a little bit of cross combing there. So this was the original Langstroth frame and the bees built the rest at a small angle. Uh, not a big deal, especially this time of the year. There is no brood on this irregularly built comb. So we can uh, separate these frames and uh, take them out of the hive without causing much disturbance to the bees. Then all of a sudden you come to a frame where there is only honey in the top band and then empty cells underneath. This is where they will be wintering. This is their brood nest and frames like that stay in the hive. Yes. Honey. Look how many bees. Yeah. Again, 
honey on top and empty cells on the bottom. Right. That's their brood nest that they prepare for winter. Compare the number of bees on this frame <laughs> compared to the ones right. there. Right, minuscule amounts. Yeah. And that's the beauty of harvesting late. You only pull honey from the honey section where there are few bees. You don't disturb the brood chamber. A lot less bees. This black small bill is a parasite that lives inside the hives and the bees clean them out and their larvae. So pay attention. The presence of these black things means that once you remove the frame from uh, the bees care, you cannot store it in a warm place. Otherwise, these small hive beetles will be able to go around and um, lay eggs and the larva will destroy your comb. Pockets where the bees cannot be reached with the brush. Uh, just give it a light puff of smoke. Do not use too much smoke on a frame, especially when honey is exposed like that. Yeah. Because it can absorb yeah. the smell of the smoke and then you will uh, smell it in your uh, extracted honey or pressed honey. Back, back! <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people always wonder, uh, we come out and we don't have veils on and everything. That's because we're picking the time of day that we're operating and we're watching their behavior. And like he was mentioning, we're not breaking open the brood and making mistakes or making movements that make them agitated. If there are a few bees that you cannot If you, that you cannot get from there. Uh, don't worry, you can still put in the box and when at home you'll just open the box and release any of the bees that uh, got a riot from the hatchery. All right. Uh, on most of my horizontal hives I use uh, a gate like on that yellow box that you can rotate in open and close position and uh, uh, leave the special reduced bars uh, for entrance for the winter. But here we are trying to preserve as much of uh, the beautiful um, artwork as possible, but you still want to block this big opening for the winter so mice cannot get in. So what you do, you take a half inch or three eighths of an inch wire mesh and just make a small piece that you are able to insert into the entrance. The bees are still able to come and go through uh, this uh, half inch mesh, but mice won't be able to get in. Yeah, this is good enough. You may be living in part of the country where even an eighth of a mesh is too big. There are some small shrews that are able to get through a square 3.8 by 3.8, in which case uh, you would need to create a skirt around the hive to prevent the mice or shrews from going up and to the entrance. But around here I've been using the half inch mesh all the time and as long as you cover the entrance like this for the winter, mice are not able to get in. So take, we gotta take that out in the spring, isn't it? Yeah, just take pliers and take it out in the spring. Right. Now we're ready to go and visit the second hive. So what you do with your honey, and before taking it to the honey room, you actually save it until you are done with all your beehives, because if you find a hive that is low on stores, you can feed them for the winter by simply dropping a frame of honey there. Ah, That's the too. only form of feeding I ever use. I don't feed bee sugar. You don't need to hassle with their, all of the feeders and uh, worrying about the right timing. Just take a frame from your reserves and give it to the hives that are too light. And interestingly, this is what uh, beekeepers in the old days were recommending. Just have a reserve of frames to feed your colonies that may need some propping up for the winter. Now, if you guys remember from uh, last year, this was actually the one we split from the hive we just left and we brought it out here to the woods. 
And so we're gonna open it up now and show you how it's done and what's been going on with it. Now, I always recommend that you catch your first swarm to get the local genetics, right. like Doug did. But once you already have the bees, instead of keep uh, climbing the trees and getting swarms from swarm catchers, you can also do artificial swarming. That means splitting your hive on your own to increase the number of your hives. Right. And that's what we did with this one early in the summer. Because this was uh, a split or a daughter of this other colony, uh, I was wondering whether we might need to give them some uh, honey for the winter. But no, we'll be able to actually harvest honey from this colony too. Yeah. And uh, here's the math. This is part of the same colony that we just visited. Right. So in reality, we got 50 pounds in that hive, and now we'll get some more in this hive. And we have two hives instead of one. Right. This is the beauty of the natural beekeeping approach. Once instead of buying bees, you make your own increase and your bees are healthy and don't require treatments against parasite and disease, then you can increase the number of your hives, avoid the expense of medications and antibiotics and their chemicals and sugar feeding and polluting your honey with all of these. And at the same time, have a very robust honey harvest, as you can see. Okay, so again, I'm... And next year will even be stronger as long as it makes it through the winter time. So it'll just get better every year. Um, so I, again, I just put a mark on the top bar if I'm going to pull this. And this is another frame I, that's uh, filled with honey all the way to the bottom. But I already see many more bees here. And on the next one, I see this transition from a full frame of honey mm -hmm. to the one that has a honey on top and empty cells below. I'll take it out and show you. That means that this next frame is what we will leave for the bees. So these two, meaning about 15, 14 pounds of honey is what we take. And this next one, you think there's any bearing at all with it being in the woods with the mites or just how it is? Um, no, I don't think the pos uh, position in the wood. Well, there are a lot more small hive beetles in this hive. Right, right. And there, actually, you know, beekeepers do say that uh, having the hive in the sun helps. Yes. Because the small hive beetles prefer moisture. Right. Uh, in moist conditions, so yes, it could be part of it. On the other hand, we're not comparing apples to apples here right. because that other hive has been much stronger. stronger. Right. So as this one builds, the load should decrease. Yeah, so let's uh, just look next year. Right. And this would be an interesting observation whether we see any trend between full sun hive and, in and the one in the woods. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the reason I am not, you know, jumping to the conclusion is that I have so many hives in the woods. In the woods, yeah. And I know that many times I open a hive that's in full shade, yeah. and I barely see any small hive bills. So and, I'm not. And in the trees too, it's the same thing for the bees and natural. I mean, they find a hollow in the tree, and it's going to catch shade and mm -hmm. sometimes more sunny. So, all right. So this see, it starts being instead of a full frame honey with a ribbon of empty cells below. And the next frame is even more so, half frame of honey and the rest is our empty cells. Yeah, you can really see the difference there. Another consideration is to leave uh, frames that the bees can really utilize and cover so that there is a good balance between the number of bees you see in the hive and the amount of honeycomb you are giving them. Because whatever they are not covering for the winter may go moldy uh, through all of the moisture being released in the hive right. if there are not enough bees to generate the heat and the fanning to get this moisture out. Here is just a little bit of brood left. And uh, I even see, see this bee with the shriveled up wings. Yeah, yeah. This is called deformed wing virus transmitted by the varomites. So when beekeepers are concerned about the varomites, it's not the mite itself that's really damaging the colony, it's the viruses that transmit. And deformed wing virus 
that produces bees that have no wings to fly and is one of them. Do they stay as workers then? Uh, they can do work inside the hive but they won't be able to fly and there, uh, many beekeepers will say oh if you have this virus in the hive you need to treat the hive otherwise they will die but I have had hives with a few of the bees affected by it uh, going for six years non-stop right. um, and the reason I drew attention to it is just to show that natural beekeeping doesn't mean that your hives will be sterile. Uh, right. They will have all of the same health conditions that commercial hives will have, but uh, a colony in balance is able to take care of the small hive beetles and viruses and small and uh, varroa mites on their own without medication and without your help. All right, so this and there are more bees on the next frame. So they're all nosing in. What is that? Does that indicate anything, how they're nosing in there? Yeah, they just, uh, after they smell smoke, uh, they go and they gorge themselves on honey. That's what they're doing now, mm -hmm. then. And we barely even put any smoke out for them, huh? Yeah. All right, so see how many more bees here on this frame? Right. And on the next frame, so we won't even go through the rest of it. We see they have plenty of honey on these remaining frames. So this is what we replace. And uh, these are three frames uh, are ours to take. So I'm replacing this divider board closer to the nest to limit the volume they have to take care of in, in the winter. With a small gap underneath and now just a couple of puffs of smoke here. Yeah. Uh, if you have a number of frames and if you have more bees on uh, one of the frames, shake it last. So I will first start with the frame that barely has any bees on it. This is what I first harvest. Again, pay attention, all of these small high beetles mean that you cannot store this frame in a warm temperature for a long period of time. Extract it within 48 hours or put it in a cellar or refrigerate it. You could even freeze it, but uh, I don't. Uh, refrigeration or cold spot is totally sufficient. Alright, now that we have some honey from the beehives, we can uh, start our uh, mead making. And I wanted to share something very beautiful with you. My daughter Lada made a new painting based on ancient Egyptian art, showing how honey was harvested from horizontal hives and how mead was produced in Egypt 4,000 years ago. And the process has not changed much since then, you take honey from the hive, you put it in a container, then you add water and let nature do the rest of the magic. Uh, this is a front piece for one of our horizontal hives that Lada made. And uh, you can get a copy to put on your hives at horizontalhive.com. And it is uh, historically accurate. All of the elements come straight from ancient Egyptian art. And I just think it's plain beautiful. It is beautiful. There are many different uh, recipes for mead, and some are quite evolved. Yeah. But I like the simplicity of the traditional recipe coming from uh, keeping bees in horizontal hives. This was used in France in the 19th century extensively, and it uses natural fermentation from bee bread. So it's right. bee bread mead. You don't need to add any uh, manufactured yeast to the uh, recipe. And everything starts with honey water and just two additional ingredients that we will address later. Um, Layens describes in Keeping Bees on Horizontal Hives that if you want to produce very high quality mead, and you know for a Frenchman it means something, yeah. he was saying if you make the right mead it won't be any worse than the best of the French wines. <laughs> That's quite a statement. So the number one ingredient is to have honey that's been pressed rather than extracted. 
If you watched the previous video when we were using this press for squeeze out honey and we put it under the microscope, mm -hmm. there was so much pollen in it. Mm -hmm. And pollen is what will naturally start fermentation. So it's preferable to use this if you are using a spinner your honey will be so clear that you will need to add the pollen, harvest and add pollen additionally. But here, if you squeeze it out, you will see that all of this uh, bee bread that's on the frame will be squeezed out and end up in mead. So with this approach, you don't need ferment uh, a starter. Right. And also, your mead will be unique every time. When you use a commercial yeast, the results will be fairly uniform because this you are using the same bacteria every right. time um, uh, or the same yeast every time but uh, with the wild yeast sir you never know how it's going to turn out and uh, it always turns out delicious but the results will be slightly different because the every pollen time. is different every time pollen is right. different and the kind of fish you'll find there is different right and the kind of bacteria that will start fermentation will be different i actually like this diversity if you want to have the uniform product that will be predictable and the same, uh, probably this approach is not <laughs> right. this. Yeah, but to me, it's uh, you know part of this excitement. You do it all natural way, and then you patiently wait for three, five, ten, fifteen years yeah. until you sample, and uh, um, the results are always excellent and sometimes big surprises. Very good. So um, you don't need to sacrifice the best of your frames for pressing. Um, Doc has a number of frames that is the uh, old standard uh, that he has been using before switching over to the very deep right. frames. So there is no more use for this uh, size of frame in Doc's apiary. So if you so, notice, this is what he's talking about is the, the depth of the frame. This mm -hmm. is a lot shallower. The other ones were a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. So for this reason, we are actually going to scrape off this uh, uh, honey and press it. If you also have uh, frames that have been cross combed or irregular or too dark black right. and you are not really going to reuse them in the hive, this is the candidate for pressing rather than extraction. And because that's the wax frames that we started off with before the um, manufactured frame, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. um, he's scraping it off, otherwise we could cut it out and then just chunk it into the bowl that way. Yeah, this uh, frame uses plastic foundation yeah. and all of the new frames that Doug is using in the hives are all natural beeswax. So. And uh, here you see clearly just why pressing honey for meat production is so much better. All of this orange and yellow and brown is bee bread in this frame. And if you were to spin this out in an extractor, you would get clear honey with not much of this in there. But when you scrape it off and then press it, it will be mixed with honey and end up um, in uh, your mead and will help reduce the natural fermentation. Break in of our Doug's brand new Italy made honey press yeah. that he got from horizontalhive.com. Thank you, Doug. Yes, you're welcome. And because uh, you can use this for a lot of things, it presses fruit, it presses apples, it presses whatever you want to press. Yeah, it tomatoes. It presses fingers, it presses. <laughs> Yeah, and so. you know another thing is that this is built out of stainless steel period right. some of them have elements that are made out of other materials but right. this is stainless steel throughout it's made in italy and the stainless steel is one eighth of an inch thick so it will last forever right all right when i first saw beekeepers in europe uh, use presses for uh, producing honey i thought well you're wasting all of the calm the wax that you're destroying but uh mm, Again, the benefits of capturing all of the pollen and it are so great that if you have frames that you are not using in the hive anymore anyway, then pressing is a much better alternative than extracting. It just looks beautiful. Yeah. Try not to lick your fingers. Yeah, you get a big sugar rush if you do it all the time. And then you are never sure what kind of fermentation you will start. Oh, I see. Yeah, 
So wash your hands before you start handling honey that is meant for producing meat. I'm not trying to sanitize every piece of equipment uh, too much. Uh, if you read books on uh, wine making, they insist on you sanitizing all utensils that come in contact with the wine in preparation to fermentation. But here it's a bit different because honey, when mixed with water, releases hydrogen peroxide. So it will sanitize much of the equipment on its own. All right, we can start there and see how some of the honey is coming out already, even before we started pressing. So all of this honey and wax and bee bread is in this uh, barrel or canister. And then as we press down, the wax will stay behind and all of the honey and bee bread will be squeezed out into this measuring cup. I mean, can you press it too much at one time or? Uh, if you feel resistance, yeah. you can keep going as far as our, uh, you can still turn it without too much resistance. And of course you want to watch the tray and make sure it doesn't <laughs> oh, yeah. elevate over. Yeah so that it drains faster than you press. And then at some point, uh, if you feel it's not going, just wait a minute. Right. Uh, let it squeeze out and then again, there will be not much resistance right. and you, you do more. And uh, see how thick this honey is and see how many quote unquote impurities there are. Uh, all of these orange specks squeezed out, this is the bee bread, pollen, the good stuff. But ironically, when they judge honey in competitions, one of the criteria for excellent prize-winning honey is to have no impurities in it. So ironically, this honey that is the most nutritional, uh, nutritious would not uh, bring you a bring, would not bring you a blue ribbon in a honey show. I like the press part. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So here, here we are. There is enough honey we pressed uh, just from that much uh, to make uh, more than one gallon of mead. So we can move to the next part. So how much honey do we need for a gallon? Um, we need about uh, four po uh, three pounds uh, per gallon. Right. I have it written down uh, in uh, kilograms because adding it uh, is so much easier. Right. The recipe comes straight from uh, keeping bees in horizontal hives. So to make one gallon of mead, we need 2.8 kilograms of water, uh, 1.4 kilograms, it's about uh, between three and four pounds of honey. Just a tiny amount, 1.9 grams of tartaric acid to level off the acidity of it so right. the fermentation starts better. We need bismuth subnitrate, uh, this stops secondary fermentation, uh, half a gram, and we need some fresh pollen as a starter. So we're not interested in how much volume this is, we're just interested in the weight. Yeah, correct. This is why I brought uh, a scale with me. Right. Um, the uh, container you ferment mead in can be anything. Right. You could do it even in a plastic five gallon bucket with the lid tightly fit. But I would recommend using glass because the mead may spend there two, three, four years. And you don't want any potential of plastic leaching in your mead over time. Right. What about so, the uh, crocs? Do you like those because they're clay, they're kind of porous? How does that work for it? Uh, you could. Yeah, uh, that right. painting from ancient Egypt, That's this is exactly clay what they were doing in right, clay. Right. Um, so if you have clay, um, it works, but realize that you will need to seal it completely so there is no excess of air. Right. This is why modern uh, glass, they're called their jugs or carboys uh, with the plug and with an airlock that I will explain in a minute, mm -hmm. is one of the setups that most people use today. Right. And by the way, you don't have to buy these gallon jugs because if you buy organic apple juice in gallon jugs, this is exactly what you need. Just save these containers, yeah. rinse them, and then you are able to use them for mead making. If you are just starting 
uh, use gallon jugs right. rather than five gallon jugs. Right. Because if something goes wrong and you spoil a batch of meat, you only wasted that much honey. Right. If you started five gallons at a time and something got wrong, you got contamination from bacteria and everything turned into vinegar instead of meat. Right. It's not as disappointing as just wasting one gallon. Right. But with the setup that we have here, few things can go wrong because it's a natural process. Yeah. It's believed that the first um, instance of people uh, rediscovering mead was as simple as some water, rainwater, getting into stored honey right. and fermenting there. That's it. Yep. Okay. All right. Off we go. So I have my list of ingredients. You can look it up in Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives. Uh, you can do pounds or I use kilograms because adding up everything is simpler. Uh, you can use electronic scale, but you know I always like the simplicity of things that don't require electricity right. and batteries. Um, so you put on the scale, it's 1.2 kilos for the jug and we want 1.4 kilos of honey. That's why I'm saying I'm doing everything in kilos, not because I come from Russia, <laughs> but because it's easy to sum things up. So 1.2 and 1.4, we need to be adding honey until we are at 2.6 pounds. Kilos. Kilos. Where's the kilos? Kilos is the, the small, black, black yeah, on the inside. Right, that's right. Kind of like the speed dial on the car. Yeah. Yeah. And I always use a funnel because pouring from any container like this measuring cup is so treacherous. You will be spilling it all over the jug. Yeah. Real honey really takes a while to get through even a bigger funnel like this. So right. be patient. Now do you want to not let that sit in there? You'll get comfortable and it might flop over or? Yeah. It depends on your scale. If you have uh, a platform that's very, very stable, All right. you can just set it there. But I would not trust this scale. Right. Right. We're, or at least, you know, hold it there. Yeah. And then keep adding more until we're at 2.4 kilos. The reason for adding honey first, you could add water or in any order. Right. But when you add honey first, then as you are pouring water in, it's already mixing it with there uh, with honey, so you won't have to do as much stirring afterwards. Takes more than you think, doesn't it? Think it'll take the whole one? Yeah, a full one is good. No, yeah. I mean, you think it'll take the whole Pyrex here? Uh, almost, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the approximate measurement is this. If you go by volume, then for every quart of uh, honey, uh, you use uh, three quarts of water. If you go by weight, then for every pound of honey, you use two pounds of water. The proportion of honey you are adding depends on how strong uh, you want the meat to be, what right. alcohol content you are looking for. Right. Uh, the recipe we are using now, which is for four parts of the mixture by volume. We are using one part honey by volume and three parts water. Or one part honey per weight and two parts are, uh, water by weight. So this will produce the highest concentrate, uh, the highest alcohol content when the fermentation is complete, about 17% alcohol content. So I want to go right to right before the 2.5 there. Uh, no, we actually go to 2.6. So past it. Mm -hmm. Because the the jug is 1.2 kilo, and we need to add 1.4 kilos of honey. Mm. 
but it's a slow process. Yeah. And you know, there are always ways to optimize everything, but it's not something that I'm yeah, don't rush it. trying to optimize because right. I, I enjoy it and just sitting there and uh, looking at the honey pouring into the jug and... All right, as they say, just add water. Now you want to use uh, spring water, um, you know, you know, filtered water, not really... Spring water is what actually specified yeah. in uh, the recipe. And we have rain water, but not your city fluoride chloride exactly. water. Yeah, exactly, because uh, the organisms that will be making fermentation yeah. bacteria, yeah. you don't want to add water that uh, is killing bacteria. Right. So spring water is best, mm -hmm. and I actually brought a jug of real spring Ozark water with go. me. Uh, so that's what we will be using. <laughs> All right, so uh, again, the proportion by weight is approximately one part honey to two parts water. So we added uh, 1.4 kilos of honey, so we need to add 2.8 kilos of water. So I put this on the scale and it's 0 0.8, so we need to add uh, 2.8 kilos of water in a couple of goes. Whoa! <laughs> That's first kilo. And water tends to run through the funnel faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure does. It doesn't disturb the honey much either, does it? Well, that's because this honey is so thick. Mm -hmm. It's been sitting and crystallizing for that's from last year. year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is one kilo. And of course, one kilo of water is one liter of water. So if you have gradients on your measuring cup, you don't really need to do what I am doing. You just can go by the gradients on your measuring cup. So this is two. And uh, another 0 0.8 kilo or 800 milliliters. Now, look there, see some air space? Sure. It's very important to leave some air space. Yes. If you were to fill it with the mixture of honey and water all the way to the top, Blow that it, out. it will start expanding and uh, some of it will be leaking no matter how tightly you, you plug it. Yep. So always about one hundredth of the volume of it needs to be reserved for the expansion when it starts bubbling. And that's any fermenting you guys do. You guys watch our stuff, we ferment the harvest, that's how we preserve our food. So any fermenting you do, you always want to leave that headspace. Very good, so uh, two remaining ingredients other than pollen. One is a tartaric acid, just the one you can buy in a health food store or any food store. Uh, this levels off the acidity to the ideal level for fermenting. Right. And of course, it's food grade. And so, just out of curiosity, what did they do before this, right? If this is an old, ancient way. They were they were adding some kind of acid. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe a orange yeah, juice or, or, or a yeah, peel like or le lemons. Lemons. Or yeah. yeah. Interesting. In some parts of the world, that they were using berries of sumac that we right. have growing here because they're very very acidic mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So any kind of acid you can find. So today or even a hundred years ago, they were already using tartaric acid. Right. Okay, so 1.2 is this piece of paper. 
so I just need 1.9 gram and when you're measuring very small amounts of uh, uh, powder uh, then putting it on a piece of paper then folding it in half and there is the easiest way to get it into the jar so I will need this at uh, 3.1 1. 1. 1.9 grams of uh, tartaric acid so that gives you an impression of how much you want uh, for one gallon mm -hmm. it's a very small quantity and there I just fold like that and slide in there all right <laughs> And we need just 0.4 grams of bismuth subnitrate. Um, my uh -huh. mom is uh, a pharmacist, so just she brought me right. some from Russia. This is something you can buy online. In Europe, it's an approved uh, drug for upset stomach and such. The amount of uh, you are putting here is so small that. Do we know what it is or what is it? Well, uh, it, it's uh, a germ killer, right. so um, you want the right kind of bacteria to live there. Yeah. But what it will do, if any of the wrong kind of bacteria got there, right. it kills them so that there is no off taste and there is no uh, um, unwanted fermentation. And what's using it called again? Bismuth. Bismuth. Subnitrate. Subnitrate. Again. Uh, keeping bees in horizontal hives. At horizontalhive.com Thank you. Uh, again, you may be tempted because you need to order it. It's not something you can buy at your local grocery store. I see. You may be tempted to skip that, but there is actually a special paragraph of that on that in the recipe that Layans are put forth. And he says, do not skip it because the results will not be the same. So is that the, typically the type of jar you would order online about this size? Oh, even much smaller. And how long because, would it last typically? Long time, isn't it? Oh, you uh, just use your it lifetime. Yeah. yeah. So it's a one-time purchase. You don't have to be a prepper minded about it. You can probably get one jar and last you for your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, in x-rays, this thing glows in, in bright blue light so when she, my m mother was bringing it on the airplane they put her back through the x-ray and there is this thing that just radiates blue light what are you carrying Aha. bismuth subnitrate what for yeah what is that <laughs> yeah. so just a little bit yeah All right, and now we are ready to go back to the beehive to get some fresh pollen. So, because we had so much pollen in the frames already, uh, you wouldn't need to go and get more fresh pollen from the beehive, but this honey has been stored for six months in right. the spring, so the pollen is not longer as fresh, the bee breath has not longer as fresh as it would be coming straight from the hive. Right. So uh, Leian specifically emphasizes getting some fresh pollen, like right now, go to the hive, get some fresh pollen and put her, um, just two grams for this amount uh, to start the fermentation process. So let's do that. Yeah, we're going. We are back. Um, the reason there is a fresh pollen in the mead recipe is that traditionally this is what was starting the fermentation. Instead of the commercial yeast, you rely on the natural yeast in the pollen and it needs to be fresh. So that pollen that you saw on the frames that we were scraping is from the spring honey harvest. So it's been there six months since the bees harvested that pollen and it is preferable for the better fermentation to get some really fresh pollen straight from the hive. So what I do when everything is ready, the last ingredient to add is pollen. I actually return to the apiary and grab her a tablespoon of pollen to add to the meat to start it. Pollen is found there inside the brood nest on the frames where bees are rearing or have been rearing brood. 
so I will go to the middle of the brood nest because this is where it is most likely to be found. And again, we don't need a huge quantity, just maybe a tablespoon or so for uh, the gallon jug that we started. French beekeepers usually were starting their meat in the spring. This way the hotter temperatures in the summer were helping with the fermentation. And in the spring uh, you would have more of the fresh pollen deposited in the uh, frames when the brood rearing is at its peak. But even now on the frames where you have brood, you will have these uh, cells filled with pollen, bee bread found on these uh, frames. So what I will do, I will take a sharp knife and harvest just this amount of pollen to help us with our meat making. If you are using plastic foundation for your frames, uh, you wouldn't be able to cut it out like that. In this case, you can take a spoon and scrape it off but this is obviously natural beeswax so I'm just able to take it out with a knife and there, that's about as much as you need for a gallon now just to be sure so we don't have to come back uh, if uh, it turns out the weight of the pollen is not enough I will get some more from another frame and uh, don't be worried about this frame that I butchered because the bees will repair it. You won't be able to tell there was a hole uh, next uh, April. Uh, the bee bread that looks moist is very nice like this one because bee bread is made through fermenting pollen that's mixed with nectar. And here is that uh, piece of uh, the old frame from the Langstroth High with plastic foundation. So I'm not able to cut through it. So instead I'm taking my hive tool and I'm scraping off that portion with the bee bread. And putting it in the stainless steel container I brought with me. And we're back! All right, here we are back with our bee brand, the pollen that bees fermented inside the bee, uh, brood nest. And there we need two grams of this uh, per one gallon of uh, meat. So if you take some of the wax and put it there, it won't spoil it. But try just to grab as much of just bee bread, this powder there, or this paste because this is what we need for starting fermentation. So what I do, I just take off most of the wax that doesn't have bee bread in it. On one side of the honeycomb there was none. And then with a skewer or with a knife or with a fork, just try to get the pure stuff here as much as possible. the same thing as what they sell in a store that's called bee pollen because bee pollen is collected at the entrance of the hive from the bees that bring it from the flowers before the bees have a chance of mixing it with nectar and fermenting it. So bee pollen that you buy from grocery stores or health food stores cannot start the fermentation because not only it's not been fermented by the bees but also it uh, has been uh, dried before you buy it. They typically dehydrate it, I guess? 
Yeah, well, it's dried. Yeah. Okay. All right, we need some more. The frames that we harvested today uh, don't have our bee bread in them. They're just pure honey because we were not harvesting from inside the brew chamber. If you harvest their frames with fresh bee bread, you would not have to separate it like that. Again, the point is you need to add fresh bee bread, fresh from the hive, in one way or another. If the frames you were pressing had fresh bee bread in them, you would need to add it additionally. And by the way, adding too much is not going to spoil it. If you had a lot of bee bread in your frames, it will just start, start the fermentation and eventually sink to the bottom of this uh, uh, jug when the fermentation is complete. nice this very moist piece of bee bread together with some dark honeycomb I'll just put it all in there without trying to separate it plus the granules of bee bread that I got from another one again the ingredients are honey and water proportion of honey to water 1 to 4 by volume or 1 to 3 by weight a little bit of tartaric acid, bismuth subnitrate and fresh pollen and we are good to go then uh, mix it you could shake the jug after closing the lid too And if you don't mix it, uh, eventually water will still dissolve honey, but mixing it thoroughly helps uh, stop the fermentation. And I know I've never been diligent enough to completely dissolve all of the honey. You want to dissolve some, but eventually this will happen on its own. The last thing we do is we need to plug the jug we, and put the airlock in. In the old days they were using old barrels, so they would just put a piece of cloth there on top of the, uh, of the opening and wet sand. Oh, that I is see. for the um, uh, gases that will be produced through fermentation to be able to get out, but no bacteria from the air being able to get into this jar. So the sand is the filter. So wet sand. Yeah, wet was sand the would sand. be the filter. Right. Uh, but then you need to keep it wet for another three years, right? right. So today uh, what people are using is called the airlock. It is a glass or a plastic uh, uh, tube that goes like that and you add enough water to block off the passage of air from the room right. into this jug. So you just open the top and add a couple of tablespoons there. There are two lines saying max, maximum level of water. And I only had to replenish it once in uh, four years that my latest batch of meat has been fermenting. Right. Don't try this at home. Good. 
You like it? Yeah. So put them there. Now, a word of caution. Uh, these plugs sometimes pop out. Right. So to be absolutely sure that it doesn't when the fermentation starts actively and there is buildup of pressure in there, um, you may want to use a piece of wire like they do on the corks on the bottles right. of champagne to uh, make sure it's solid there. You could run a piece of scotch there like duct tape uh, to uh, hold it there. But otherwise, just press it very, very firmly in. And I think we'll be all right. There we go. Now this cap here, straight, crooked, doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean. well, it, the only thing it does is preventing insects right. or dust from getting into there. All right. <clears throat> so we just walked you guys through the whole process of making mead. Now you gotta wait seven years, so make sure you subscribe to our channel or you're never gonna see this follow-up video. <laughs> Well, for the sake of making you guys wait seven years, we went ahead and uh, Dr. Leo brought his meat up that he's been working on. And so we're going to show you guys now how to bottle it and what it looks like when it's finished. Yes. And you know, I mentioned in the beginning of today's our, uh, videos that uh, for me, meat is not about intoxication. Meat is this uh, amazing natural alchemy. And every time you start a batch of meat that will take four to seven years to complete, you start scratching your head and thinking how old you are and what will transpire in these seven years and how old your grandchildren will be and on and on and on. So for me, it's just a glimpse of eternity and the flow of time. Every time they have to slow down and do something as long term as a batch of meat. Right. So this one I brought here was started in the spring of 2017 and again the same thing in the reverse when you start bottling it you remember things that happened in the four and a half years since this was uh, bottled and on and on so it brings a lot of good memories to and not so good memories at the yeah. same time anyway so i wanted to show you this uh, so as doug explains you don't have to wait four or seven years the fermentation process took two and a half years but then it was murky and then it took another year for it to clear and you don't normally don't want to bottle it until it's totally clear and when you're ready to bottle it don't move the drug so what i did this morning uh, was not right because when i was driving five hours all of the sediment that was on the bottom right uh, it's now all murky again if we were to give it a couple of days it would settle and then we would bottle it but uh, for the sake of demonstration i will show you how to bottle it today even though normally i would wait for all of this disturbed sediment going down on the bottom we can just leave it with us and we'll just you do could. it later on and, we'll just... and again it will not hurt your meat if you were to bottle it when it's murky like that but then when uh, it's uh, in the bottle, the sediment will be in the bottom of the bottle like this and it just makes it uh, mm, less attractive than a crystal clear bottle would be. So another thing could I wanted... Could you strain it as you, you were filling the bottles? Would it help at all with that? Yeah, you could, but then there are filters that are able to capture this very fine sediment will right. probably also capture some of the goodness of your right. meat. So that's not something I would do. Uh, another thing I wanted to draw your attention to, look at how much sediment is on the bottom. This is the pollen that was in the mixture when the fermentation started. After the fermentation is over, all of the pollen stays at the bottom of the jar and it just gives you an impression of how rich this honey that was pressed as opposed to just spe uh, expelled in the centrifuge, a honey extractor is. Right. All right, so uh, bottling is very simple. You need to transfer it from here into your choice of bottles. And I wanted to uh, give my opinions of uh, what works best. Um, if you are going to consume your meat fairly quickly, then uh, 
the flip top bottle is probably the easiest choice uh, but I cannot resist uh, the desire of doing the proper way of packaging it the way uh, honey, mead and wine has been packaged for centuries with the real cork so then you actually need to pull the cork and there is this popping sound for me it's uh, very satisfying and part of the enjoyment of mead so even though this is practical for short-term consumption I actually do not use uh, uh, these are bottles myself for mead. Then you have all kinds of shapes. If you if you are a wine drinker, just save your bottles and just rinse them and clean them very thoroughly. Uh, there are special uh, uh, cleaning agents or, and disinfectants sold in um, brewing supply stores that you can use for making sure your bottles are crystal clear. Uh, if you have to buy bottles, this is what I do. I prefer the bottles that have the volume of half the standard bo uh, um, wine bottle. Oh, I see. The standard bottle is uh, 750 milliliters. Right. These are all 375. And the first time I saw that was when I lived in France uh, in 1999. All of a sudden I saw that in France m almost all of the wines in the store had two versions. The big bottle, the regular bottle and the half size of the bottle and they were consciously promoting it as a way of avoiding overconsumption of alcohol because once you open the bottle you feel like you know it needs to be finished at some point uh, so if you open a small bottle you're just not getting as much uh, alcohol with it and for me you know a bottle like that will probably last two years because I only taste meat for the taste of it I never really drink it right by the way you probably are not aware that in many languages and not just English the word mead has the same root as the word medicine M-E-D in Russian means honey M-E-D, med, med. Uh, and in many other languages there is this connection because in the ancient times mead was also produced adding all kinds of herbs to, to the mix at the time of fermentation so it was part of the herbal medicine tradition in many parts around the world. All right, stay healthy and drink made in moderation. All right, so all of these bottles are just half the size of the uh, regular wine bottle. And uh, you have a choice of clear glass and uh, uh, green glass or tangled glass. For storage, this is best yeah. because if it, there is any source of light, uh, then this will protect the liquid uh, better long term. Also, if you do have a little bit of sediment that's left in the bottle after uh, bottling and eventually goes to the bottle to the bottom of the bottle, this will be concealed here, so you won't uh, see that. However, if you are going to give me these gifts, then uh, clear bottles make for a nice presentation because you're also able to appreciate the beauty and the color of the meat and different batches will be uh, differently colored then in terms of the shape of the bottle you know take your pick i think this is one of the most spectacular ones because it looks so big it's almost like a regular bottle but it's half the size of the bottle because it's so slender I should mention that it is not legal to sell mead in, uh, in uh, probably any of the uh, 50 US states without a license. So you can give it as gifts, wink wink, but you cannot really s uh, sell it. So here we go. We need to transfer it from this uh, uh, jug into the bottles. And the only thing that you really need is a piece of tubing. Now, there are all kinds of other useful implements that you could use to make uh, it easier and faster. But again, the only essential piece of equipment is a piece of 3 8 of an inch tubing that you can get in any uh, brewing supply store. It is recommended to sanitize your bottles and pipes and everything prior to bottling. I am not too diligent about that probably depends on how long you think the meat will be stored after bottling. If you think that this bottle will be there aging in your cellar for another 10-15 years, then probably it does make sense to very thoroughly sanitize everything. 
I don't think I have a 20 year old bottle of my mead lying everywhere so I haven't been as diligent as I should be. Sanitation is very simple. Uh, there are different disinfectant powders being sold for uh, purpose of sanitizing wine making equipment and mead making is not an exception. So one of the most popular ones in sodium, method by sulfite. And you take uh, four tablespoons of that per gallon and you mix it thoroughly and this is your disinfectant for disinfecting the bottles. These are brand new bottles from uh, uh, a carton so I don't uh, sanitize uh, uh, brand new bottles, brand, brand new bottles yeah. straight out of the box. If I was reusing a bottle yeah. I would sanitize it for, for sure. sure. Alright, so you mix water with uh, sodium metabisulfide and then things like corks and bottles and tubing needs to be sanitized. So I'll just take a bowl, I'll put the, the corks I think I will be using today and I add some of this solution. In addition to sanitizing them it makes them more sleek so when they go into uh, the bottle they are easier to insert. And for the tubing, just fill it with this liquid in there and just drain it down. All right. Uh, this uh, sanitizer is food grade. So even if you have a little bit of this water left in the tubing, it's not like you need to completely dry to get every last drop out. That will be alright. Alright, so you put one end into your container and another one in the bottle. So that's one way of doing it. The other things that are sold uh, and used for it to make it easier, you can have a, what's called a wrecking tube. You attach it to the end of this tubing and you put it in uh, into this container. What it does is that if this is tending to coil it will be more difficult to reach to the bottom of this container but because this is straight it can be glass or stainless steel or plastic it will go easily to the bottom of your uh, jug even if it is a five gallon jug. Uh, another option to start uh, dispensing liquid from here you would need to suck at the end of the tube don't touch it with your lips just through a hand or a piece of paper and I will demonstrate but another option is to use uh, it's called auto siphon it's a pump and it has this action there so you insert it instead of this racking tube you just pull it up one time and as you're squeezing down this uh, dispensing starts on its own and finally when you are putting it into the bottle and the bottle is near full you need to stop the flow. How do you do that? Of course you can pinch the tube with your finger. What I use, I use just the surgical uh, clamp like this. The last time I used it before doing mead was to clamp the umbilical cord of my home burn child. So when you are not using this for clamping umbilical cords you can very successfully clamp the tubing you are dispensing mead through. It will work. I just like using the minimum of things sure. I have to, but I'm showing you all of the options. So when I'm doing it myself, I only use a piece of tubing and this clamp, and that's it. But again, this is convenient. And another thing uh, that is convenient is called a bottling stick. What it does is you put it on the side that goes into the bottle, and it has a valve at the bottom. So when you press this valve, it starts filling. When you release it, it stops the flow. All right. So then you wouldn't need the uh, hemo. Then, then you wouldn't need the right. clamps, and they can stay reserved for clamping the umbilical cords. All right. All right. Let me sanitize this wrecking tube. Just all it takes is really getting some of this sanitizing liquid in there and running it all the way through and just 
taking a piece of cloth, dipping it in there in the liquid and sanitizing it on the outside. If you have big enough container like a five gallon bucket with the sanitizing solution you can just submerge it there. Okay this is good enough and there uh, insert it in one end. So let me show you without the auto siphon first. Uh, you insert the end in there and then you suck not on the tube but like through your hand Okay, so you will be feeling it. Like our old gas siphoning days. <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> With this one, don't put it, push it all the way to the bottom, especially if you have sediment there. But you pull it up and down. And you pull it up and down a couple of times. All right, and it will then start the siphon. All right, then it goes into the bottle. By the way, if you are using this special stick that uh, has the valve end, then bottles with the flat bottom work best. Okay, let me show it a different way without this thing. I hate this thing. <laughs> All right. Okay, this is how I do it at home. The heel bit way. Or let's say the simpler way. Alright, make sure the carboy is uh, elevated and then I just put the tip of this tubing in there and then suck at this end of the tube until this is well um, filled. Yep. All right. And now it'll suck gravity right through it and the gravity will take care of it. Continuous flow. Yeah. That's how I do it. So, oop. Need a little head space there. All right. First time I ever had meat, actually. Wonderful. All right, corking. Uh, there are all kinds of plungers uh, being sold for uh, sealing the uh, bottles, corking the bottles. There is one that looks like uh, just a piston made of plastic, requiring a lot of force. There is one when you are bottling a very large number of bottles that stands on the floor. You put the bottle and there is one big level, a lever uh, for sealing that. And uh, before we start the uh, corking, I just want to show you one more thing. This is showing you the potential alcohol content 
in uh, the meet before it uh, started. When I was uh, starting this batch of meat, it was showing the potential content of 17% uh, here. So by putting it there and there uh, in the bottle, it shouldn't be fully filled uh, and letting it float, you will know what uh, alcohol content you have now through the difference of what it was and what it is now. So it's floating and it's showing 8% alcohol content and the whole thing started with 17 or 18. That means that this meat is about 10% alcohol. Uh, the recipe that I use uh, allows the maximum fermentation uh, rate of 17% alcohol content, but it depends on the bacteria and fermentating conditions as to how much uh, it will be in the finished product. This is a corker uh, that's uh, handheld and uses both hands to for leverage. So you put the cork here. Press it down, it grabs the neck of the bottle, then press against the table, I do it on the floor, lo and behold, it's there. Bottles to look professional and very presentable, um, you can buy these uh, heater shrink wraps. Uh, you put it like that and just uh, put it in boiling water, it shrinks and then it will be similar to how you buy wine in a store. Here's an example of this presentation. Uh, another option is to use wax. They sell what's called bottling wax. You bring it almost to a boil to dissolve it and then you just dip the end of the bottle into this wax and let it solidify. It creates the seal. In addition to being uh, nice and ornamental, it does have a practical purpose. It prevents the cork from drying out right. for very long-term storage. Now it's not going to be a very immediate proposition because the bottles are usually stored on their uh, side and the mead or wine is moistening the inside of the cork, keeping it moist and expanded. Right. So there is n not much risk of anything getting into the bottle in storage. But for long storage, you just want to prevent uh, any risk of bacteria or dirt or even smells getting through the cork and into the wine. Uh, traditionally, they were using wax. Uh, you can boil even beeswax, not boil. You can heat beeswax, uh, liquefying it, right. and just dip the bottle into beeswax. Take it out, let it drip off, and put it in cold water for a few seconds to turn solid. Or you can use the what's called bottling or bottle wax that's sold in brewing supply stores. But for uh, just sealing it so that there is no uh, bacteria or anything potentially getting in there, one option is as simple as taking a wax candle and just dripping enough wax on top to completely seal it. That's how they used to do it. You know, part of the reason they were sailing it like that is not for safekeeping, but to be able to brand the bottle. Right. Uh, in the old days, uh, labeling and attaching a label was uh, tricky. There was no sticky, sticky paper. Yeah. So how do you really attach ta um, paper and make sure it stays there? So the uh, 
wine manufacturers, they have their own seal. Right. So they're putting some wax there and just pressing their own seal yep. as branding of our, their bottles. Like the kings on the envelopes when they used to mm -hmm. send them around. Uh, but uh, um, just, you know, dripping a few drops of beeswax from uh, a candle is enough just to seal it for long-term storage. Uh, mead and wine is best stored at uh, a temperature of a cellar on its side. But a very important precaution is make sure you don't store anything with a strong uh, odor there and no vinegar. Right. Uh, because there, um, there is always a risk of some of it getting in there. It's not as important for finished wine as it is for the one that's being fermented. But uh, do not have your fermenting container with meat uh, in the same room as they may be. Uh, vinegar especially yeah. in large quantities and uh, this is about it uh, um, it's a good idea to label it right. if you make multiple batches or if you uh, share it with your friends and get friends made then over time you may forget you know what kind of batch uh, uh, when you made when, it when it, when you made it the same thing with starting made putting a date there and any special notes uh, uh, it's helpful just take some um, paper they say they sell special labels where you can write it down and uh, I actually do like them because they have the kind of adhesive on the back mm -hmm. that you can peel off right with many other sticking papers they are so aggressive then you cannot really peel it off you have uh, parts of paper uh, on, on the bottom but this sir after you no longer need it and need to put uh, another one to reuse the bottle uh, can be more easily peeled off right and this one is good to go okay so we extracted honey we showed you guys how to make the mead we showed you several different ways to siphon it out of the jars and put them in the bottles and we showed you the wax and we showed you all the stuff you guys need to do so you can make meat on the homestead right so if you got any questions leave them below in the comment section because we'll try to go through the video in a couple days after you guys are watching this and answer the questions that you do have now if you guys are interested in beekeeping without the mead we have a whole playlist of all these great videos that Dr. Leo and I have teamed up to do, bringing you all information from starting hives, winterizing hives, collecting the honey, checking on them, what to look for, how to split. It's a great playlist. I'll leave it right above uh, Dr. Leo there, and it'll be the first comment under this video. And one thing I want to say for sure is Dr. Leo is open source, they're kind of like us. So everything that you guys want to learn is for free, like if you want to build a horizontal hive or if you want to build a swarm trap or anything like that, it's all for free at horizontalhive.com. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Yeah. And there, uh, you know, I wanted to emphasize how simple it is because if you look back in the videos, um, you will see that Doug caught a swarm, put it in a horizontal hive, then we divided this hive this spring, and now we were harvesting 75 pounds of honey from these hives without other management than putting the bees in the box and letting them work through right. the summer. And there, some people, when they read their, uh, the Lane's book, are Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives, uh, write back to me saying, well, but there is not enough on management there. I'm saying, well, that's the exact point. This style beekeeping is natural and much simpler than the conventional approach that you may be familiar with. But even the old books on beekeeping published in America in the 19th century were saying that one of the great impediments to a good honey harvest is the beekeeper. <laughs> if you are trying to manage your bees too much, right. it's counterproductive. Right. So uh, books like Keeping Bees with a Smile or Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives are reminding us uh, of how simple beekeeping can be and used to be yeah. and it's still practicable today by anyone who would like to put their really pure honey on their children's table. It's almost like anything. As soon as man gets involved, it gets all kind of messed up. So we try to always track down the old ways, right? Making meat is old ways. For us, a fermentation, collecting the um, honey. We do all the old ways, you know, managing the bees. So always try to look back 
before the food revolution and the industrial revolution and try to find out how did they do it on the old days. So. Yeah, I can agree more. You've seen that I was struggling with this game, yeah. right? With all the siphon because that's not how I normally do right. it. In the old days, they were keeping all of the tools to the bare minimum right. and it worked. It does. So don't forget, check out HorizontalHive.com. We have some other stuff that we have coming up, maybe a spring class here at the homestead. So you guys got to keep in tune with what we got going on and we're going to let you know how that breaks out. Dr. Leo has classes at his homestead too, so you can go to his uh, Horizontal Hive website, sign up for one of his classes. They're hands-on. I've attended them uh, usually once a year. I'll even come down to a class, so maybe next year we'll have a class up here and a class down at his place, uh, so you guys will get the opportunity to hang out with us both together. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, I congratulate you with such a good honey harvest. Not too bad. Your bees are thriving, and they're, they're now winterized, and they're I look forward to the next season next year. Right, so you guys will stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe because when we come out of uh, winter, we're going to see how those two hives did. And last year, if you remember, we had a little problem with some mice in one hive, so we're going to see how everything worked. And we really appreciate you guys stopping by the homestead. If you got any questions, leave them down below. And make sure you check out horizontalhive.com. All right, we'll see you guys on the next one. Wow.